this uh, morning's video is a subscriber request and regards the pros and cons of inbreeding. But to do that, I will also uh, touch the other types of breeding in this topic. So I will also touch upon outcrossing, scatter breeding, and line breeding, and actually inbreeding. So first of all, some definitions. Inbreeding. Inbreeding is breeding back on one specific uh, dog and doing that in quite an intense way. So the relationship with line breeding is that inbreeding is a lot more intense on one specific dog, especially sometimes several specific dogs but mostly, especially one. I will give some examples of inbreeding as compared to line breeding. An inbreeding could be if you have a father uh, crossed with a mother, of course, that results in a daughter, and then you breed back that daughter to the father again. The resulting pups are then 75% uh, the father and you are inbreeding upon the father. An example of looser inbreeding that is more towards line breeding is that you have the same combination uh, father here mother that results in a daughter and then you cross it with another dog that results in a in a granddaughter and then the granddaughter is uh, again combined with that original father which so the granddaughter is, compa is combined with the grandfather and that is more of a line breeding inbreeding or an inbreeding that is less strict it depends a little bit on your uh, definition and why is that so because also in line breeding you have an inbreeding coefficient. So an inbreeding coefficient will tell you something about the genetic diversity. So the higher they are, the less genetic diversity. And this is in general <coughs> a bad thing. But there are some pros that's of course as well. So being in general a bad thing is because you are losing, now it says Jacob's ladders in the sky, you're losing genetic diversity. And if you have nothing to add to that, normally a dog breed would deter. And why are there some benefits involved also with inbreeding? Well, if you're inbreeding upon an exceptional individual, you will get more of that exceptional individual traits. So for example, if that exceptional individual is very fast, and you're inbreeding on that fast individual, you're likely to get also very fast pups out of that, perhaps even faster. Because by inbreeding, you can also increase the chance that those good genes find each other and also click in some way. So, in the short sentence, what does inbreeding bring? It brings you a lot more uh, stability in the result. Another thing is that mainly inbreeding is snared upon because they see a lot of uh, troubles in show dogs. Or they think that uh, their purebred show dog is a lot better than that father-daughter combination but they might be very wrong and why is that because if you have a show dog normally those show dogs have not been tested to be worth it instead of just looking nice another thing is that almost all show dogs are the result of inbreeding to a high degree for example you have some breeds that are approaching 
85% inbreeding coefficient. So that's utterly insane. If you would have like uh, 12 times subsequent after each other um, inbreeding of the father to the daughter and then etc. So the, the granddaughter of that again to the father etc. Then you will still, Goedemorgen, still have a lot less than 85% that you see in some dog breeds. And an example of those dog breeds that have an insane high inbreeding are Lundehund. You can look that up. So that's giving you some background. So a father or daughter would you only be giving you an inbreeding coefficient of like 25%. And it's still a lot higher than you would like, but it's nowhere near that 85%. And that's 11 or 12 generations, as I mentioned, will give you like 50 or 55% coefficient of inbreeding. So it's a little bit, yeah, we call that hypocrite if you think that, that, that your dog is so much better. That's one. And the other thing is, if that father was an exceptional animal, or is an exceptional animal, you still have the benefits of that exceptional animal that you don't have in that uh, normal show dog that's already higher inbreeding altogether. The nice puppies, huh? Beautiful, beautiful puppies. Love them. Very uh, tender. Then there's uh, something else, and that is inbreeding is next to in the show breeding world was also uh, in show breeding they use the inbreeding to refine them eh? so as they say not refining it's just exaggerating some traits that they have to divide them from other dogs that are related uh, for example a flatter face in the english bulldog as compared to the Staffordshire bull terrier to an enormous degree if you look at the old English Bulldogs, they look more, a lot more than like the current Sebastian Bull Terriers. Same with the Massino Napolitano. The Massino Napolitano of the old days looked a lot more like uh, the Cane Corso of today. So it gives you some insight. And the Cane Corso of the, yeah, the past looked a lot more like uh, a bull lurcher or a massive uh, Greyhound cross. But that being said, there are some things that you uh, will also get. And that is next to the benefit the benefits you can gain from inbreeding, yeah? so more reliable and higher chance of some exceptional exceptional traits if you're inbreeding to an exceptional dog. That you also get drawbacks, such as inbreeding depression so what is that inbreeding depression is the result of yeah, high inbreeding so to say and then you get for example less uh, long-lived dogs you can also get dogs that are not that uh, fertile that they have problems to uh, get uh, normal size litters, etc., or uh, limited sperm count, and already in the first uh, father-daughter cross, you can diminish a little bit of the age. It also depends on the health of the dog you're inbreeding to. Of, of course, not, if that is an exceptional health, for example, if the average of the breed is 12 years without inbreeding. <laughs> You have a dog to live to 18 in a good health you're inbreeding on that dog of course you can still get a very good uh, long liberty prospects out of that so that, that can also give you an indication so the the opposite of um, inbreeding would be scatter breeding so just breeding all those dogs together and also a lot of times people think this is the best because those muds, so to say, you can also have a mud in a specific breed because it doesn't have consistency. You just breed it 
all over the place have a lot more genetic diversity and therefore could be better in living a long age, etc. And if you're just there for a house dog without a performance needs, this can be a good bet. Huh? But there are also drawbacks to that because the consistency will also diminish. And you don't know ex exactly what you're getting, especially if multiple breeds are involved all the time. <coughs> so, what's the benefit of line breeding? You get a lot of the benefits of inbreeding, but you, because you do this in a looser way, so to say, you just breed on the line of the dogs or the parent of the dog, or, you can also involve those, then you have a lot less facet on that uh, the bigger bulb. Now this goes down. You have a lot of the benefits without the drawbacks to the same degree. So of course it will be a little bit harder to have the consistency that you could easily get with, uh, with inbreeding, but also you have the benefit that you don't have to cross air the pheasant is. See? In the middle of the screen. A nice big pheasant, huh? See him running? I just wanted to show this. He's now a little bit reluctant, but uh, you have a lot of the benefits without the drawbacks to the same degree. So what you are getting is a line, and sometimes the parents of the exceptional animal are better than the exceptional animal itself, because they were able to produce an exceptional animal, whereas the exceptional animal, you don't know for sure if they can produce the same. And by adding these uh, multiple layers of genetic diversity, but still uh, along the sides of that specific line, eh, you will have a lot of the benefits, namely the consistency will be high, the genetic diversity will be higher than inbreeding, so also a lot less inbreeding depression. That being said, even carefully selected lines are often in need of an out and that will also introduce another aspect of breeding being the outcross so what does an out mean so every time you breed in the line it is an in being in breeding or just staying within the line yeah? both have the in in it and then if you take an out an outcross to a different line that is also very consistent, for example, and could, could be an inbreeding result of that different line. Eh? Could be within the same species, of course. Then you can have new blood added and still keep the consistency. And it's a great benefit because you will have all the benefits of this line breeding, inbreeding program that gives you the consistency. But when there are some drawbacks, for example, inbreeding depression, that are uh, halting your line, or you're lacking some strength or other things, then the outcross to a dog or a line that doesn't have that drawbacks that much, or has a nice genetic click, as uh, been proven in the past, could give you that hybrid figure again. So you get new genes introduced, the hybrid figure oftentimes produces exceptional animals in the first generation. Therefore, I also told you it's not that much an exceptional animal will also produce exceptional animals. It could be that their parents are the better way to go. And after this, this outcross, this F1 outcross between these two inbred lines, then they go in again, so into the one of the parent lines. So for example, you have line A, the output cross to line B, and the result, the AB, you cross into A again. So then you have 75% A line, and just 25% of the B line, and you can have multiple generations crossing it back into the A line again, without big inbreeding depression. And that gives you a big benefit as a breeder, of course. Outcrossing will 
oftentimes result in exceptional animals, but if you're not breeding them into the one of the parent lines again and would across again to another line that's not related, you will be scatter breeding after a while and you will lose consistency in performance as well. It doesn't mean that those dogs cannot live a nice long life and could be good uh, pets, but as a performance dog, enthusiasts will be a little bit harder on yourself. So that also brings you probably at a point, what would I advise? I would advise exactly where I ended off with, to have a line that produces the dogs that are closest to what you want, uh, in a performance sense. And if you have those, look for a good outcross, so when the time comes, that you can uh, go out. There's another thing. For example, in working terriers, the out can also be a completely different breed. So, for example, sometimes petted terriers have an out towards the Lakeman terrier, towards the border terrier, or towards, for example, a Staffordshire Bull terrier if they are lacking strength or lacking size. Because also inbreeding depression very often brings down the size again. So if, you, so if you have an outcross potential which will increase the size, this can be beneficial because one of the factors, if that is uh, of relevance to your specific breeding uh, program, could be that after a while the size is declining a lot and if you have a certain type of dogs that need a big size, for example a man stopper type of dog or a hawk dog, a catch dog type, then it would be nice that you in the outcourse will get a little bit bigger dogs than the dogs that you want to end up with. And if you then are inbreeding again or line breeding again, and I prefer line breeding because the factors that I told you, then you can do this for quite a while before you need another out due to size restrictions by line bidding too much. So I hope this video was insightful and also answered the question of the subscriber or as some more. Have a great day. This white car, I'm also coming to the white coloration in Staffordshire Bull Terries. And why is that? Because I'm going to tell you a little bit more than only about the white coloration. In the past, in the show Staffordshire Bull Terrier, the white coloration was dominant. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the numbers, most of the, those, if you could only uh, point out one color, the white coloration or dominant white eh, with some other patches, was the most common color in all Staffordshire Bull Terriers. The dog on the leash here is a Petrol Terrier, he's more black with a brownish tint in color. But nowadays, Staffordshire Bull Terriers have a completely different palette in colors, with white being the least uh, dominant color in amounts, etc. Which is a big. So, what happened? Well, blue came from specific breedings and they found that this coloration in the beginning was more in the Atlantic uh, Stephanie Bull Terriers found. But then it dripped down into the show versions, and even exaggerated show versions, and nowadays. By selecting for that color, nowadays it's the most dominant color. And all other colors are yeah, just almost rare at this time. And there's something else happening. The most dominant color, especially white, has suffered the most. So you might think, okay, yeah, colors change. Also colors can change in the cars, for example. 
So, for example, in the past, flip-flop color was not possible in cars, and now it is possible. But there's something else to consider, and there's something else is this. If, for example, in the past 25% was dominant white, and now it's less than 1%, you have lost 24% of the genetic population, you might think. But there's something else as well. If in the past, for example, the grey color, the blue color, as they call them, were less than one-tenth of a percent, and they are now over 30%, that 0.1% has now been 13% of the total population, which means it has, uh, has been 300 times as much in relative sense than it was in the past. So also those limited genes, uh, that consist of the, the blue-gray color, are now that much exuberant, whereas at rich genes, because you already had a lot of dogs that had the dominant white color, are now almost completely gone. So you lost a lot of genes, and those that you got instead of them are very limited. Right. So that is a big detrimental impact on genetic diversity. That's one. Another point is that with blue color, which is a dil dilution, you also have a higher chance of genetic diseases and other diseases. So the dogs become also less healthy in general. And if you select for performance, it's not a big deal. So the resulting uh, pieces of the puzzle are not as beneficial for the breed. And of course the breed already had suffered quite a bit because it was now selected more on looks and looks and the performance has been uh, put aside quite a bit. Also the, the breed of Sefshire Bull Terrier has two show standards, so the early show standard which was close to the Bull and Terrier and then the later one. And the later Used um, show standard dictated that the weight could be the same, but then uh, the head of the width should be decreased. So that results in a more stocky built Staffordshire Bull Terrier. And even so, if you look at that show standard that they revise, huh, then you see that most Staffordshire Bull Terriers if not 95% are bulkier at this moment than even the revised show standard. So that gives you some insight what has happened to the breed. Well, I'm not here to bash this breed because I like it a lot, but I do find it a pity that a breed that was once very functional and also very diverse in genes uh, has now been uh, reduced so much in genetic diversity and also in uh, performance all to look a certain way instead of uh, yeah, act the same way and of course I'm very happy that it's not as exaggerated as in the English Bulldog by far not but I don't like it, it especially if you have a breed close to your heart have a great day